In the next, uh, t today and also next week, uh, I want to share about what I'm calling missing links. Lots of times there's a lot of things that a church does that a church does really good, uh, but sometimes there can be a few little things. And so this last week, um, while I was in prayer, I was asking God, are there any things in our church, uh, in this congregation, that I could consider as a missing link, something that needs to be emphasized? And uh, so tomorrow, uh, today, we're going to look at one of those areas. It's kind of like, uh, sometimes you can be doing a lot of good things, and uh, the area that I'm going to deal with today is actually an area that, that we do maybe better than a lot of churches, and that is we are engaged in the, uh, the, th the things that are happening in the political world, in the law-giving world, and we try to keep each of you informed in that area. And then I was thinking, okay, so if that's true, that we are kind of at the forefront of some of these areas, uh, you know, what about the other churches? Are they doing anything at all? Well, I don't know because I'm not there. But I do know this is that we're still lacking. And we, we need more. And there's more that we can do. And uh, just to kind of emphasize that point, I came across the several emails that were sent my way this last week and um, needed to write some letters to Premier Notley, to our health minister and so forth, and uh, just kind of procrastinate. It's so easy to procrastinate on those things. So at the end of the service, I'm going to ask, ask the uh, ushers to make photocopies of a sample letter that can be uh, written to the leaders of our province because our health area is a provincial area, uh, especially in the, in the uh, concern of whether or not to bring uh, a, what do they call it, a drug, uh, a safe injection spot for drugs here in Medicine Hat. And you might say, yeah, we need that, or no, we don't want that here, uh, but here's some, we want to give you some tools, because frankly, when I first heard about this, I was uninformed. I didn't even know that this was an issue. So uh, in talking to people and studying a, a bit, I found out a little bit more about it. That's what we're going to talk about today. But, but uh, next week, I uh, also want to talk about other missing links, um, things like evangelism and so forth. Um, it's like uh, back last spring, I think it was, maybe last winter, um, my table saw broke down, so I went to the store and bought a new table saw, and it came in a box, and you had to assemble it yourself. And so I looked at the instructions, and I was assembling this table saw, and everything went really well, except when I got to the end, I found out there was one screw missing, and there was one lock nut that was missing. And I thought, you know, if I take it back to the store, I've, I spent a couple hours on it already, putting it together, it was almost all together. If I take it back, they're probably going to take that thing, I don't know if they'll send it back or throw it in the junk heap or whatever they do with that, uh, but they'll give me a new box and I'll have to start all over again. So what did I do? I went to my little uh, drawer of screws and bolts and I found something that would fit and I screwed it together and it works fine. But that was just one missing bolt made quite an impact on the, the whole construction of that table saw. Uh, something worse happened to me this last week. Of course, Pauline was gone. She wasn't there to keep me in line. So I, I decided to uh, go over to my favorite pizza shop and uh, buy a pizza from Papatazzo's, the best pizza in town. And uh, so I brought home a Hawaiian pizza. And I thought, I can have a couple of meals out of this. So the one night, I had two pieces of pizza. There's six pieces in a pizza, if you didn't know. And uh, put the rest back in the box, and the fridge was kind of full, so I, I slid it on top of the pickle jar uh, and put it in the fridge. Well, that was all good. The next night, I came to have supper, and I opened the fridge door, and my pizza was gone. And I knew that I had put it in the fridge. I knew that I had balanced it on top of some other jars and stuff. And I looked, and I looked, and there was no pizza box. Well, there's only three people that have access to my front door, know the code to get in. One's my neighbor, and I can't imagine he came over and stole my pizza. Another is, uh, is Brian and Holly, and so I, I called up Holly, and, and, and she hadn't stole it, honest. And, and, 
Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the other is my other uh, sister, uh, daughter, Sarah Lynn. She know, and so uh, I didn't get her. She was at camp, by the way. So maybe Vladimir had come over. And I could not figure out where did my pizza go. So I'm putting on my shoes and I'm looking through flyers to find out, okay, so I'm going to go to another, fa I'm going to go to fast food, just pick up something. I'm looking for some sales, two for one burgers or something, you know. And I, I put my shoes on. And I thought, you know, I should look in the fridge one more time. And I opened the fridge door, and here where I had slid in the pizza box, it was high enough, it was just underneath the, another shelf. Slid right to the back, so when I looked in there, all I saw was the shelves, and I could not see the pizza box. We're, we're talking about a box this size. And I couldn't see it, it was underneath the shelf. And I looked, there's my pizza. <laughs> Sorry, Holly. <laughs> and I'm glad, Brian, you didn't tell you. <laughs> but anyways, there it was. No, that was a little embarrassing. I phoned up Pauline at camp, and I said, guess what? I found the pizza. So she got a laugh out of that. But I was thinking about the various aspects of ministry, and, and sometimes we just, you know, things that we maybe get used to seeing or not seeing that we we don't even think about anymore maybe a newcomer or a visitor comes i like to ask visitors sometimes you know what do you think of the service is, is there anything that's missing you know and because they they can see things that we don't see if we've been here for a number of years kind of well every week we do this, you know a lot of the same things and it's it's easy to miss something but sometimes there's missing links and uh, I was thinking there's probably some areas that need stirring. There's a lot of things we do well, but some things we can do better. So today, I want us to, uh, first of all, look at some of the revivalists in Scripture. And I'm just going to summarize a few of them, and then I'm going to talk about Elijah, Elijah at the end of these. But first of all, Josiah the king. Um, he removed all of the sinful objects of worship, 2 Kings 23, 4. He removed the articles of Baal from the temple. He burned the wooden idols and the other ones he ground to dust. He removed the idol priests and tore down all the high places of idol worship around Jerusalem. He tore down the ritual booths of perverted persons where women had woven hangings for an image. He even removed the horses that had been dedicated to the sun. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, yeah, we need somebody like that today to rise up and uh, to make some changes in our country. Then there was Ezra in the rebuilding of the Temple of God at Jerusalem, and he had to get the favor of the Persian kings. He had to overcome the opposition of those that wanted to see Jerusalem remain in ruins, and it wasn't an easy task for him. Then think about John the Baptist in the New Testament during the time of when the Pharisees and Sadducees had a lot of spiritual control and there was unfaithful leaders. John the Baptist came preaching what? Preaching repentance. And there, it wasn't anything that had been preached for a while, but John the Baptist came and did that. Peter and Paul, they weren't used to having the Gentiles included by God in anything. And, and so both of them, their ministries shifted from working with the Jews only to God showing them that they needed to include the Gentiles as well. Well, that brings us to Elijah. We're talking about standing up for truth. And man, we need people that are going to stand up for truth these days. Elijah had one of the worst kings of all time in Israel to stand up against. His name was Ahab. And the evil at that time, it was uh, during a time when a lot of people were just letting go and letting anything overcome their land. Um, it, let's, let's summarize his ministry. You know, I'm going to use... Four statements that were given by Greg Smith in a last last week. This was on posted on the online in word-smith.info if you want to look it up. But the first one was spiritual confusion abounds. So just before Elijah enters the scene, the Bible tells us that King Ahab's wickedness was worse than any king before him. So you can imagine how bad he was. His devotion to Baal was no doubt influenced by, by his wife. Does anybody know who Ahab's wife was? Jezebel. Yeah, very good. Jezebel. She came from the land of Sihon in the north, and that marriage, of course, would prove to be disastrous to Israel. She exerted a lot of control, and um, Israel had held to one God, but when Jezebel came along, she talked to Elijah. She hated Elijah, of course, because Elijah was standing up for truth. 
And what was her statement? She said, so may the gods do to me and more if I don't you know, end your life. So she was really into her gods. Kind of interesting. That's 1 Kings 19.2. But Ahab brought Jezebel's gods, Baal and Asherah, the worship into Samaria. And Jezebel sponsored 850 false prophets. 450 for Baal and 400 for Asherah. This is in 1 Kings 18 and 19. So the worship of Baal was well established in, in and around Canaan by the time that the Israelites occupied the land. And Baal's basic identity was that of a storm and a fertility god. Baal worship entailed sacrifices, usually sacrifices of animals, but sometimes sacrifices of humans as well. And those who were loyal to Baal and Asherah destroyed the Lord's altars and they killed the Lord's prophets, 1 Kings 19 and 10. But here Elijah stood up. You remember him standing up on the mountain. And he accused the people of wavering between two opinions. Do you remember that? In chapter 18, 21 of 1 Kings. Elijah asserted the supremacy of the Lord. And he called down fire from heaven. And in that demonstration, it was following a drought of three plus years. He discredits Baal's identity as the Lord of the rain. For three years it hadn't rained. And, uh, but he stood up. And you know, I was thinking about that today. We have various levels of political powers, but there doesn't seem to be anybody that stands up to them and says, no, this is not of God. We're not going to do this. When we talk to the school boards, they say, well, this is something that's mandated to us. It's a command from the provincial government. We have to institute the gay-straight alliances into the schools. You have to have a policy that uh, accommodates that. And, you, and so there's nothing we can do. It's handed down to us. Nobody has the fortitude to stand up and say, no, we will not do it. And I think we need to pray into that, that God will, st will bring us an Elijah. They will stand up and say, no, we will. Like the apostles said, we would rather obey God than man. You know, that's uh, in the city of Medicine Hat here. The, uh, the mayor and, and the council is saying that the provincial health laws, and it's true, the, the health laws are dictating that we must have a safe drug injection site in our city. And so they, they say, well, we have to comply to that. Man, I just wish they'd just stand up and say, no, not in this house, not in this city. We're not going to do this. But God give them the, the ability to stand up. I think that's the difference between the political scene and the Christian scene. We stand with God. We stand with the apostles. We'd rather obey God. And it's a kind of godly Christian value standing that drives the evil lawmakers nuts because they don't know what to do with the Christians. <laughs> But they're not going to know what to do with the Christians because we're going to stand in the word of God. And we won't comply to that which is harming society. We'll call it for what it is. The second point that uh, Greg Smith mentioned was God's people persevere in their faith. I'm looking at a group of people this morning that I trust are going to persevere in their faith and make a difference. Under the influence of Jezebel, she threatened Elijah, but, and Elijah fled far into the desert. And uh, his plan was to get isolated in the far corners of the desert, and he'd serve the Lord there. This is 1 Kings 19 and 1. But the Lord revealed at that time when Elijah was way out there, he says, Elijah, I've got several thousand. Does anyone remember the number? 7,000. I've got 7,000 Israelites who had not compromised their allegiance to him by worshiping Baal. That's 1 Kings 19 and 18. So though God's people were definitely a small minority, the Lord had not forgotten them. In the face of a similar apostasy in the New Testament, Paul wrote this. He says, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. I want to tell you this morning, God knows who, that you are his. There's no doubt in his mind that you've been born into his family. And you might stand as a peculiar people, but I want to tell you that as Christians, we are not conformed to this world. We belong to Jesus, and he hasn't forgotten us. So it says in 2 Timothy 2.19, it says, Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. 
And though Jezebel had purged the land of a lot of the prophets, there were at least a hundred that were saved by a godly man whose name was Obadiah. This is not the Obadiah, the author of the book Obadiah, but another man that lived during that first king's period of time. It said here, he served in Ahab's household. Interesting. Here's this man who served in the most wicked king's household and yet had not bowed his knee to Baal. That's cool, isn't it? He testified to Elijah. He said, I am your servant. I feared the Lord from my youth. This is chapter 18, 12. And the author of 1 Kings summarizes the commitment when he says about Obadiah, he says, and Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And in the midst of the worst of circumstances, Obadiah stood for God, even if in a measure of secrecy, but he stood for the Lord. At the end of Elijah's ministry, God directed him to Elisha, so uh, Elisha to Elijah, so that Elisha could uh, succeed him. And at that time, there were several communities of God's prophets, and at least two places in Bethel and in Jericho, where they were still teaching the prophets of God. So what am I saying? I'm saying that in the midst of what seems to be a dark cloud over the nation of Israel, God still had his people. In the midst of what seems to be a dark cloud over our nation of Canada and our province of Alberta, that God still has his people. God's still going to do a work. It might be different than what we think. I think God's going to rise up people within our congregations that are going to begin to minister like never before to the things that the, the government is trying to minister to, but they, they can't seem to find a way to minister to the people that are hurting and, and in bondage. But God's people can. God's people know deliverance. God's people know the Word of God. God's people know the Spirit of God can break every chain. Praise God. Amen. So the third area that uh, Greg Smith talked about was leaders exert enduring influence. In 1 Kings offered a summary assessment of Ahab's character. It says, there was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab. So Ahab, what is, what is saying is he sold his principles in order to bring the wickedness into the land. It says, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols. So the king had sacrificed his principles to obtain what he wanted, which included everything from idol worship to purchasing a, a comparatively worthless uh, uh, vineyard. And Ahab's sons, Ahaziah and Jehoram, succeeded him, and both of them were evil. What, what Ahab started was succeeded. Oh, how we need to have a change in the leadership today so that we can see the, the ongoing generations from this point on. We can make a difference. It can start in the here and now, and it can make a difference for generations to come. Even if, Brother, Brother Daniels, even if you and I aren't here, it won't matter, but we can make a difference for generations to come. And uh, if the Lord should tarry, of course. If we have inherited the consequences and circumstances of others' bad choices, then by God's grace we can break the cycle. The fourth thing I want to share today is that God persists in seeking a people for his name. You remember what Jezebel said to Elijah? Elijah? It says, as the gods, by my gods, you're not going to live? Well, this was the answer of the Lord. In chapter 17, once, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. Verse 12, as the Lord your God lives. 18.10, as the Lord your God lives. Chapter 18.36, you are God in Israel. You, O Lord, are God. Chapter 18.39, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And so they turned the tables on Jezebel and said, there is a name that is higher than all of the names of your gods. He is the Lord. There is no name like the name of our Lord. And the prophets especially Elijah, were instruments that the Lord chose to use to, to call people back to himself and to work out faith in righteous living. And given the powerful influence that the political leaders wield, it's not surprising that the prophets addressed the spiritual choices of Israel's kings. God noticed 
Ahab, he, he did make a change of mind and behavior somewhat. And uh, God removed some of the plagues from his life, but it was, he kind of was self, self humbled. But God showed him some mercy. And the destruction didn't come upon him so much as on his sons. Jezebel, however, didn't repent in the least bit. And uh, if you remember the prophecy over her that the dogs would lick her blood and so forth, well, that, she came to that fateful end. That's how she died. But the Lord's pursuit of a people is not confined. It wasn't confined to the borders of Judah and Israel. And uh, while Ahab and Jezebel were trying to push the gods of that day and the Baals and the Asherahs, God was at work in the people's lives and in the prophets' lives during that time as well. God's pursuit of the people continued. Elijah went to a widow, and uh, based on her words and actions, we, we would conclude that she was a woman of faith. She said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar. And it says that she went in and did as Elijah said, and the jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, that it was spoken by Elijah. Again, here's Elijah doing the work of God. He didn't back off. Maybe he fled to the desert, but God brought him back. And he made an impact in helping people. He made an impact before kings speaking to kings. I was thinking about that and how there needs to be a balanced approach by Christians today. When we see the cloud of wickedness that's going hovering over our province, there needs to be a balanced approach where on one hand, yes, we do stand up before our leaders and we say, this is what God says. This is what the word of God says. But if that, that's not enough, we also need to continue the ministry that takes place like Elijah went to the widow's house and continued to minister to her. Even so, we also need to find a way to minister to the people that are being neglected. So I've been praying, God, what shall we do? to minister to the drug addicts? What shall we do to those that are in bondage when the government is trying to give them safe places to inject so they don't get H HIV? Uh, we think of that. What shall we do? If we don't have a positive response to bring to that, what is the church going to do that's going to make a difference? So I think it's twofold. We need wisdom. We need not just to rant about what's taking place of all of that. It's easy to rant about all the evils in the world, but we need to have a clear vision of what we should do and to move into that. So we, God give us a heart to pursue the lost and the wayward, just like God has a heart for that. So um, I want to share a few things. I, I did a little studying about this uh, safe injection site that is being mandated. And I found out back in 2011, there was a group of people in Ottawa, this is according to CJCY FM, that uh, tried to get some of the safe injection sites overruled in Vancouver. And the news put it this way, the Supreme Court of Canada has ruled against the federal government's efforts to close a safe injection site for drug addicts in Vancouver. So the Supreme Court of Canada got in there and said, no, you can't close those. And um, so I just thought I'd mention that. Um, and then two years ago, here in Medicine Hat, Chat News said that Canada currently has only two drug injection sites in Canada, both in Vancouver. And we know since that time that Calgary has one, and I think Lethbridge has one, and there's probably other places. Um, in that same article, they were talking about uh, Ms. Nat Chief uh, Police Chief Andy McGrogan, who said that he has concerns over, over these supervised injection sites. And he said this, we know that fentanyl, a couple of grains inhaled or touched through your skin, can kill a caregiver or a police officer arresting, affecting an arrest where they come across this stuff. It's a big issue. He said, at the end of the day, we need to stop consumption of it. And I'll say amen to that. Also came across, this is just from May of this year. It says, the Medicine Hat Police administered naloxone 32 times for opioid overdoses. And uh, Inspector Tim McGough said, that's not getting any better. 
As of May, they had administered on 12 people to try to save their lives because they had overdosed. And uh, since then, it's been, there's been a lot more, I'm sure. Um, but it says that the province had, province had approved the HIV community link's request to pursue a safe consumption site in this city. So that was back in May. And they said they saw it as a pressing need here. And the government is spending a startup grant, that's just a startup grant, of $900,000. That's almost a million dollars to fund this project. And I don't know what your viewpoint is on this. Um, this is what I think. <clears throat> I asked the Lord to kind of show me in Scripture, like, what, what's the approach we should take. And in confronting this, I, I do see Elijah very clearly, where God raised up somebody that would say, I, we're not doing this, and would eradicate the problem. Our chief of police would agree with that. He said, somehow we have to eradicate the drugs. It's not enough to just say, well, we're going to keep people safe in taking their drugs. And so, I mean, the, the letters that are being sent to the government now by Christians are stating, is this really what we want? Is this what we want is to accommodate the use of drug taking under supervision, places where apparently the police will not even have access to go to. That's, that tells me there's some dangers there. So like Andy McGrogan said back in May, um, I, I think there's, there's some issues there. There's some problems. It was a couple of days ago, maybe three days ago. I'm driving down below the hill here, and you know there's a recovery center just on the top of the hill. So I, I assume they're doing good work. And this uh, young adult lady uh, walking quickly towards that building down at the bottom of the hill. You know how a stick man looks like. Well, that, that's, she was a stick woman. Just no, hardly any muscle on her bones, no fat whatsoever. And I couldn't help but think, just by the way she looked, she looked tattered and torn, that she was bound by a lot of things, and probably by drugs. And I was thinking about Elijah, and, and as I was praying into that, it was like God was just saying, this isn't the time to accommodate it, this is the time to eradicate it. And if you spend $900,000 on helping to find a safe place for them, how much money is being spent on trying to get the druggies out of the city and the, the dealers out? I don't have all the answers. I'm not in, in a place where I even would know the answers to that. But when I look at the Bible, it looks like God's answer is to cleanse the land, not to accommodate sin in the land. How that might look, I don't know. I know that God also, or Jesus, when he came to earth, he was a friend of sinners. This isn't the time for Christians to stand up and, and begin to judge those that are bound and broken by sin. That's why I say it, on one hand we got to stand up against the evil, on another hand we got to lend our hand to help. And maybe your knowledge of these areas could easily be greater than what my knowledge is. I don't know. But maybe you know some of your neighbors or some people that you can lend a hand out and help them. We have to find a way to, to link this back up because it's a missing link in, our, in, in the church in general. And we need to be in a place where God can use us. We might be surprised where God takes us with this. Because if we don't stand up, if we don't do something as God's people, we can't depend on others to do it for us. It's not going to happen.